From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Is this truly a humanitarian intervention? What is humanitarian about, about providing to one side of the conflict the ability to wage war against the other side of a conflict, which will inevitably trigger a civil war making all of Libya a graveyard. Democratic Congress member Dennis Kucinich accuses President Obama of violating the War Powers Resolution by attacking Libya without congressional approval. He says the president's actions are impeachable. We'll also speak with the Ohio congressman about the anti-union bill Ohio Republican Governor John Kasich just signed into law last night. Then we turn to Ivory Coast, where heavy fighting's underway. Troops loyal to the rival of President Laurent Gbagbo have surrounded his presidential palace. I think it would be uh, a premature uh, and probably uh, a little bit uh, 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 reckless for me to predict uh, when uh, Bagbo will fall, whether it will be in the next several hours, uh, the next several days, or the next uh, several weeks. Uh, but it is absolutely clear uh, that he is in a substantial and significantly weakened uh, position. And the 2012 presidential race is off and running. It'll be the most expensive campaign in history. Obama's hoping to raise a billion dollars. We'll look at his campaign manager, Jim Messina. From his stands on health care to gay rights, he has many progressives deeply concerned. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Clashes are underway in Libya's eastern oil town of Brega, as rebel fighters try to reverse the momentum of the forces loyal to Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. The rebels are said to have made gains to retake Brega following a night of NATO airstrikes against Gaddafi's troops. Rebel groups, meanwhile, are accusing the Gaddafi regime of committing massacres in the town of Miserata, with shellings reportedly killing dozens of civilians in the past last few days. A rebel spokesperson told Reuters at least 20 civilians were killed and many wounded when Gaddafi forces bombed a number of homes. The Western bombing campaign has also reportedly killed a number of civilians in recent bombings of the capital Tripoli. A top Vatican official said he's heard credible reports new airstrikes have killed at least 40 civilians. The deputy commander of the NATO force, Canadian Lieutenant Charles Bouchard, said he's taking the report seriously. We are very careful in the prosecution of any of the possible targets that we have. We have very strict rules of engagement provided to us, and we are operating within the legal mandate of our United Nations Mandate 1973. Defying before Congress, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, said the Gaddafi regime's forces aren't near a breaking point despite being weakened by the bombing. We have actually fairly seriously degraded his military capabilities, his air defense capabilities, his command and control capabilities. We've uh, attrited his overall forces uh, at about the 20 to 25 percent level. Th that doesn't mean that uh, he's about to break from a military standpoint, because that's just not the case. There has been speculation over whether rebel fighters will be able to defeat Gaddafi without an invasion by foreign troops. Appearing with Mullen, Defense Secretary Robert Gates reiterated vows not to send U.S. soldiers into Libya. There will be no American boots on the ground in Libya. Deposing the Gaddafi regime, as welcome as that eventuality would be, is not part of the military mission. In my view, the removal of Colonel Gaddafi will likely be achieved over time through political and economic measures and by his own people. While the Obama administration has not sent troops, CIA operatives are on the ground in Libya as part of a covert Western force aiding the bombing campaign. According to Reuters, CIA operatives were sent into Libya even before President Obama signed a secret order authorizing the covert mission. The Gaddafi regime continues to face reports of high-level defections. A number of regime figures, including the head of Libya's de facto parliament and a former prime minister, are said to have fled to neighboring Tunisia. Meanwhile, Libya's former foreign minister, Ali Treki said he'd turned down a request to represent Gaddafi regime at the United Nations. The Libyan government has apparently also asked Nicaragua's former foreign minister, Miguel de Scoto Brockman, to serve at the UN on its behalf, but there's confusion around whether the request has been formalized.
The news follows the defection of Libyan Foreign Minister Moussa Koussa, who is now in Britain after crossing over from Libya to Tunisia. A Gaddafi spokesperson confirmed Koussa's defection, but insisted the Libyan government remains intact. They are here. They are doing their jobs. And if some, if some of them left in the, few, in the last few hours, maybe I did not hear about him leaving, you know, it would usually, you know, be on, on a mission, on, because we try to negotiate with the world. Our officials do travel daily, by the way, and they do come back daily, by the way. The death toll from weeks of fighting in Libya is unknown, but it's believed thousands have been killed. Speaking in Cairo, the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees, Antonio Guterres, appealed for humanitarian access to civilians victimized by the conflict. I would also like to say how concerned we are with the humanitarian situation in Libya. There is a lot of discussion in the world, a lot of coverage of the military and the political aspect of the conflict, but very little attention. Uh, to the humanitarian dramatic situation in the country. Here at home, Ohio's Republican governor, John Kasich, has signed into law a measure stripping public workers of collective bargaining rights and barring them from striking. The legislation will affect over 360,000 workers, making Ohio the biggest state so far to curb the rights of public sector employees. In addition to undoing collective bargaining, the law forces public workers to pay at least 15 percent of their health care premiums, removes automatic pay increases, and makes it more difficult for unions to collect dues. Opponents say they'll attempt to undo the law by putting it to a public referendum. Wisconsin Republicans have announced they'll stop trying to enforce their anti-union law following a judge's ruling it has not yet taken effect. On Thursday, Dane County Circuit Judge Marianne Sumi reinforced a temporary restraining order she'd initially issued last month blocking the measure's implementation. Judge Sumi had ruled Republican lawmakers were likely in violation of state open meeting laws when they pushed the legislation through. Earlier this week, Republicans and top state officials had said they would ignore the order and enforce the law's provisions. The anti-union push is being mirrored across the country. On Thursday, lawmakers in New Hampshire and Oklahoma advanced measures that would weaken public sector unions. Meanwhile, in Maine, Republican lawmakers are pushing two bills that would roll back parts of the state's child labor laws. The first measure would let employers pay workers under the age of 20 a full $2.25 less per hour than Maine's minimum wage for their first 180 d uh, days on the job. The bill would also eliminate the maximum number of hours a minor 16 years of age or older can work on a school day. The second measure would allow 16- and 17-year-olds to work an hour later on school nights. Talks continue on Capitol Hill over a budget agreement to avert a government shutdown. Senate Democrats have rejected a measure approved by the Republican-controlled to cut federal spending by $61 billion. This week, the Obama administration said Democrats and Republicans had agreed to cut $33 billion, which would be the largest one-time reduction in U.S. history. But on Thursday, Republican leaders say no commitments have been made. Republicans want to impose drastic cuts on longtime right-wing targets such as National Public Radio, Planned Parenthood and the Environmental Protection Agency. Foreign aid would also take a significant hit. The nation's top foreign aid official is warning the Republicans' budget bill would lead to the deaths of 70,000 children who rely on U.S. assistance worldwide. Testifying before a House panel, USAID Administrator Rajiv Shah said the Republican measure, known as H.R. 1, would force cutbacks to spending on malaria control, immunizations and childbirth attendance. Shah called the 70,000 estimate a conservative figure. Displaced residents of areas near Japan's stricken Fukushima nuclear plant have been told their evacuation may last four months. Thousands of people have been living in temporary shelters since the earthquake and tsunami badly damaged the plant. The announcement comes as high levels of radiation have been found in groundwater near the plant for the first time. Radioactive iodine was found at 10,000 times the legal limit. The Japanese government, meanwhile, is reportedly considering using public funds to buy a controlling stake in the plant's owner, Tokyo Electric Power Company, in order to take—exert greater control over the recovery effort. 
Ivory Coast leader Laurent Gbagbo is battling to remain in power as his rival Alassane Ouattara's forces surround the main city of Abidjan. Much of the fighting is concentrated around Gbagbo's heavily fortified presidential palace. On Thursday, Ouattara's prime minister Guillaume Soro said Gbagbo's days at the palace are numbered. Babo is finished. Uh, I don't know, but uh, I'm not waiting for this ultimatum. Okay. Yes, uh, we, 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 we well organized and we think that uh, things are over now and Babo must resign. Himself. How long? We'll have more on the Ivory Coast later in the broadcast. Protests are continuing in Yemen against embattled U.S.-backed President Ali Abdullah Saleh. Thousands of people have flooded the streets of the capital, Sana, to honor the dozens of people killed in Saleh's crackdown on the uprising. Saleh has withdrawn an offer to step down by the end of the year following the collapse of talks with the opposition. At least six U.S. soldiers have been killed in eastern Afghanistan over the past two days. The Pentagon says the troops were part of the same operation, but were killed in three separate incidents. And a former manager at California's San Onofre nuclear power plant is suing the facility's owners for allegedly firing him in retaliation for reporting safety concerns. Paul Diaz says officials at Southern California Edison fired him shortly after the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ordered the company to address what it called, quote, a chilling effect on addressing workplace safety. Diaz's lawsuit says the NRC first investigated the plant after it received anonymous reports of infractions, including shortcuts on testing new generators, unreported safety violations, falsifying records, promoting a culture of cover-up, and ignoring chronic fatigue amongst overburdened workers. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world.